If we pray. Yeah. And everybody said. Yeah. Good evening everyone. We thank the Lord for the Bible study tonight. And I pray the Lord will enrich every life in the world in Jesus name. And for those who are outside, I praise the Lord for you. I wish I could bring the pulpit outside there to speak directly to you. But we are connected. Outside people, I said we are connected. And the Lord connects everyone who has heaven in Jesus' name. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for tonight. Thank you for the Bible study. We thank you for your goodness over your people. And we thank you for the great expectation of your people. And I pray, Lord, there will be a realization in every life in Jesus' name. I pray, Lord, that tonight you speak to everyone. Touch every heart in its definite way. I will pray that your word will not be in vain in any life. You bless everyone and make us channels of blessings to people around us. We thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. God bless you, consider. We're coming to John chapter 12. In John chapter 12 tonight, we're studying from verse 1 all through to verse 11. Look at John chapter 12, reading from verse 1. Then Jesus, six days before the Passover came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, which had been dead, whom he raised from the dead. There they made him a supper. And Martha served, and Lazarus was one of them that sat at the table with him. Then took Mary a pound of ointment, or spikenard, very costly, and anointed the feet of Jesus, and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the odor of the ointment. Then says one of the disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, which should betray him. Why was not this ointment sold for three hundred pence and given to the poor? This is said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief. I pray you will not be a thief. And had the bag and bear what was put therein. Then said Jesus, let her alone. Against the day of my burying, as he kept this. For the poor always ye have with you, but me ye have not always. What people of the Jews therefore knew that he was there, and he came not for Jesus' sake only, but that they might see Lazarus also, whom he had raised from the dead. For the chief priests consulted that they might put Lazarus also to death. Because that by reason of him, many of the Jews went away and believed on Jesus. Many believed on Jesus. Thank God you'll be one of the number in Jesus' name. As we look at this passage today, we want to remind ourselves that in the previous chapter, Jesus Christ had raised Lazarus from the dead. He had been dead for four days, in fact, was in the grave already, and his stone was put on the grave. And of that, Martha thought everything was over, Mary thought everything was over, and the people that came to Mary and Martha, they thought everything was over until Jesus came. When Jesus comes to your life, everything you thought was over, there will be a new beginning. And then he said, take here with the stone. And he took away the stone. And then he looked up to heaven. And he said, Father, I know that you hear me always. But because of these who are here, I'm calling upon you. And then after that he said, Lazarus, come forth. What happened? He came forth. He that was dead had been buried for four days. Everything was over. And he came alive. And the people heard. The people who were there, they saw it. And all the people that were not there, they had that. And now Jesus went away and now he came back to Bethany. As he came back to Bethany and the people knew that was there in that same house. Mary was there, Martha was there, Lazarus was there. So they came, they said, we well, want to see that Jesus. So you see that Jesus in Jesus' name. Not only that, not only because of Jesus, they wanted to see Lazarus whom he had raised from the dead. 
That's the reason why we have this passage today. But go back to this passage again, chapter 12, verse 1. It says, Then Jesus, six days before the Passover, stop there for a moment because it talks about the Passover. What was that about? It was uh, the time when the children of Israel came out of Egypt and then they passed over because the death angel passed over them. Life came to them when death came to the children, the people of Egypt. And now we're talking about life after death. And we're talking about these people coming into life and the death angel passing over them. And then so appropriately it says that the days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany. And you want to understand in the language of uh, today, it was a new experience for them. In fact, as you look at the gospel according to St. John, everything was new. You're coming to John chapter 2, water turned into wine. It was a new dawn. It had never, never happened before. And then you come to chapter 4, when Jesus met that woman and said, the person you are with now is not your husband, but you've had five before. It was a new thing. Nobody ever gave any revelation like that. And look at this man in chapter 5. He had been uh, there impotent for 38 years. And there is no record in the Old Testament. Somebody had been in the in, uh, incarceration or has been in a kind of uh, impotence for 38 years. And Jesus just said, uh, well, touching him, uh, rise up, take up your bed and walk. It was a new dawn for them. Look at them as they were all gathered together listening to the word of God. And Jesus said, they've been with me now for a long time and I don't want them to go back without any food and then the disciples said how are we going to feed them 5,000 men and women and children how are we going to feed them and one lad there had a lunch and Jesus took that and blessed that and multiplied and gave to everyone it was new to them. It was new. In the whole Bible, in the Old Testament, you'll never see anything like that. It goes on and on like that. The person that was born blind, he just said, receive your sight. And then made the clay go and wash. He came back. He started seeing. And this one we have just read about now. Lazarus dead for four days, came alive. Something that never happened in your life will happen again. Yeah. That's why we're saying that as John is telling us and revealing this to us, John is showing us a new dawn, a new era, a new dispensation, a new covenant, a new thing. And the Lord is still the same yesterday, today, and forever. Our new dawn has come. December 22nd to 25th, we're going to encounter the Lord Jesus Christ, the author of a new dawn and the foundation of a new dawn and the one that projects to us a new dawn and the same thing that you saw here that something that never happened in your life before miracle that never happened in your life before the great expectation even beyond your wildest imagination is going to come upon you in a few days time you'll be a different man you'll be a different woman you'll be a different family and this church will become a different church in jesus name hey, look at this look at this again i'm reading from chapter 12 verse 1 it says then six days before the passover what was why were they celebrating the passover number one it was to be the remembrance of their new dawn the remembrance of their new dawn it happened many years ago they said why it not that that something happened that he passed over us and he gave us the passover why it not for that would have still been in slavery would have been in egypt or been under the oppression and therefore the Lord instituted that Passover for them uh, to be the remembrance of a new dawn. Number two, it was the refreshing of a new dawn. Refreshing of a new dawn. After you've been away from the Lord for some time uh, and then you'll be by yourself, yes, you're coming to Bible story, yes, you're coming to Sunday worship. Somehow, somehow, you feel dry, you feel weary and then they were to come together again for this Passover remembrance so that there will be a refreshing 
refresh him. It was to be number three, the recommitment to the nation's new dawn. Recommitment to the nation's new dawn. As they went to that Passover, they were reminding themselves the God of yesterday is the God of today. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is the God of today. And Jesus Christ now became the Passover. You are wondering why are we, why are we going for retreat and why are we following after this same pattern of the children of Israel? After all, we are not Israelites. Come to First Corinthians chapter five. I'm reading from verse seven. First Corinthians chapter five. I read from verse seven. Pour out therefore the old leaven, that she may be a new lamb, as she are unleavened. Listen to this: for even Christ. Our Passover is sacrificed for us, which you will have something to remember. That's why we're coming together this period, December 22nd to 25th, because Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. We want to have a refreshing of what Jesus Christ has done for us on the cross of Calvary. That's why we're coming together, and we want to have a re-establishment, a recommitment to that new dawn. And then he tells us that we are now like like they were, they are the nation of Israel, but who are a nation too? We're looking at First Peter chapter two. First Peter chapter two, and I'm reading from verse nine. In First Peter chapter two, verse nine, it says, "But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people." You see, that's the similarity between us and the children of Israel as a church. As the people of God, as the assembly of the saints, of the children of God, we're a new nation, and holy nation, a peculiar people. And it says that you should show forth the praises of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. We're going to be in that marvelous light in Jesus' name. As I said, the children of Israel, they continued celebrating at the Passover from year to year to year. But how did they do that? How did they gather together? How did they tell the people that were not there, the people that didn't know about the Passover, how did they eventually know Second Chronicles? I'm reading from chapter 13. Second Chronicles chapter 30, and we're reading from verses 1 and 2. You look at this, and then you understand why we're doing what we're doing, how we're doing what we're doing, and the result of uh, the things we're doing. Second Chronicles chapter 30, I'm reading from verse 1. And Ezekiah sent to all Israel and Judah. Did you understand, do you understand that? Ezekiel is the king now. He sent to all Israel and all Judah and wrote letters also to Ephraim and to Manasseh that they should come to the house of the Lord at Jerusalem to keep, tell me, the Passover unto the Lord God of Israel. That's what we call today proclamation. That's what we call today publicity. That's what we call today blazing it out, blowing it out, telling everybody in their own case, you know, what they did. Here was uh, Ezekiah, and here was Jerusalem. That was their headquarters. And then he put letters in the hands of people that took all the letters about, and they brought them, and they brought them exactly the things we're doing. We're sending out uh, SMS messages, we're sending out letters, we're sending out invitations, we're sending out everything over radio, over television, over every thing that we have in the social media, what are we telling them? The same thing they are telling them here that this was the time of their Passover. It was the time of a new dawn for them and therefore we are sending information to everybody. You are sending the information. You are contacting people and you are telling them come and as they come a new dawn of a Passover will happen to them in Jesus name. Look at verse 2 look at verse 2 so for the king are taking counsel and his princes and all the congregation in Jerusalem to keep the Passover in the second month. All the people they took counsel and they said they were going to keep the Passover and uh, you will be there. 
I said you will be there. Let, look at verse 5. It says so. They established a decree to make proclamation, to make proclamation publicity throughout all Israel, from Beersheba even to Dan, that they should come and keep the Passover. That they should come. Nobody will say, I will receive it in my house. I'll stay in my house. I'll try to, you know, keep that day to myself. And then I will remember the past. He said, no, no. Everybody must come. And that's the reason why during this uh, coming retreat, as we remember the new dawn, as we remember what Christ has done, as we remember what Christ is still going to uh, put in every life, establish in every life, we are coming from every local government. We're coming from every community. We're coming from every district and coming from every group and coming from all the cities and all the towns in every region. And we're going to congregate together in a central place where the word of the Lord will reach and reach everyone in Jesus' name. And then it says to keep the Passover. It tells us in that verse 5, it says unto the Lord God of Israel at Jerusalem. That's at the capital, at the headquarters. For they had not done it for a long time in such sort as it was written. So the posts went with the letters from the king and his princes throughout, tell me, all Israel and Judah, according to the commandment of the king, saying, The children of Israel turn again unto the, unto the Lord God of Israel. I see. God of, uh, unto God of uh, Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, and he returns to the remnant of you, that he will return to the remnant of you, that I escaped out of the hand of the king of Assyria. We're going to do it in Jesus' name. Uh, and you know that this continued, this continued, even until the New Testament, we'll come back to John. In John chapter 11, I want to remind you of what uh, happened the last uh, week at the, at the Bible study. It says in John chapter 11 now, verse 55, look at verse 55, and the Jews' Passover was near at hand. They kept it at hand. They kept the date uh, open, and they knew that days must be an event they must go to. And so they said, it's coming there, it's coming. They were, they were reading the count, counting down and they were saying, it's coming, it's coming. And it says that the Jews' Passover was nigh at hand. Look at this. And many, tell me that word, many, shout it out. Yeah. We're expecting many. We're expecting multitudes. In your locality, thousands must come from your locality. In your group, thousands must come from your group. It says many wait out. You go out of your community, out of your village, out of your town. We're going to this central place where our own new dawn, the Passover, and death will pass over you. Sickness will pass over you. Calamity will pass over you. All the things, all the assets of, the, of life, everything will pass over you in Jesus' name. But you have to come out. Come out of where you are. And it says many went out of the country up to Jerusalem before the Passover to purify themselves. Our own time has come. And so we find that the Lord... As he raised up uh, Lazarus, it was not the Passover was not coming. And so he went to Bethany. And from the passage we have read, which we are looking at today, today we are looking at reasons and reactions to Christ's new dawn. The reasons and the reactions to Christ's new dawn. And we are dividing the message to three parts. Number one, the anointing and adoration of the Savior Jesus. The anointing and the adoration of the Savior, Jesus. Number two, the avarice, that's greed, that's covetousness, the avarice and atrocities of secretive Judas. Judas was a secretive man, a secretive disciple, that the other disciples didn't really know much about him. And everything he did, he did secretly. The avarice and the atrocities of secretive Judas. And then number three, the acknowledgement and the affirmation of some Jews. The acknowledgement and the affirmation of some Jews. Let's come back to number one. In a number one, that is the anointing and the adoration of the Savior Jesus. We're coming to chapter 12, verses 1, 2, and 3. Then Jesus, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany 
when Lazarus was, which had been dead, whom he raised from the dead. There they made him a supper, and Martha served, but Lazarus was one of them that sat at the table with him. Then took Mary a pound of ointment or spikenard, very costly, and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped the feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the odor of the ointment. There are uh, three people here having an encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ. Look at verse 1. Then Jesus, six days before the Passover came, Jesus came. And thank God he's here tonight. I said he's here tonight. And everyone in the house, there are three of them in the house, one Lazarus, two Martha, and three Mary. They had an encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ according to their need. As we look at those verses, number one, the courageous affection of Lazarus. The courageous affection of Lazarus. Here is the one that traced him from the dead. Here is the one that changed his destiny. Here is the one that gave him eternal life, abundant life, extra life, and a happy life. And because of that, he had courageous affection for the Lord. Why do we say courageous affection? Is it not enough just to say affection? He loved the Lord because the Lord had done such a great thing for him. Look at verse 10. Look at verse 10. But the chief a priest consulted that they might put Lazarus also to death. They consulted that they would put him to death and he didn't care for that. That's how we say it was a courageous affection. He stayed with the Lord. The danger was there. The plot was there. The conspiracy was there. And all the things the chief priest said he will do were going to terminate his life because through him many people are believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. He was not afraid like you will not be afraid. He was not timid like you will not be timid. He was still affectionate. He was still showing affection and close association to the Lord Jesus Christ. Number one there, the uh, courageous affection of Lazarus. Number two is the consecrated activity of Martha. The consecrated activity of Martha. Because we're told in verse two, and there they made a him a supper, and Martha served, and Martha served, always active, and always uh, profitable, the consecrated activity of Martha. Number three there is a costly anointing of Mary, the costly anointing of Mary, because we are told in verse three that they took a Mary, a pound of ointment or spikenard, very costly, and anointed the feet of Jesus, the costly anointing of me. Let's look at them one by one. Number one is the courageous affection of Lazarus. Even though they were plotting to kill him, yet he remained with the Lord. Like you are going to remain with the Lord. The Lord has saved you. You are going to remain with him. He brought you from death unto life. You are going to remain with him. He canceled the penalty. He canceled the punishment of sin from your life. And therefore, whatever threats and whatever other people say, you abide with the Lord in Jesus' name. In Colossians chapter 3, I'm reading from verse 1. Colossians chapter 3, verse 1. If ye then be risen with Christ, you know what that is saying? It said, you too, you are dead. You are dead in sins and trespasses. But now Christ came to you. And a new dawn of salvation, a new dawn of conversion, a new dawn of passing from death unto life. And it says, if ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are born, where Christ seated on the right hand of God. God. Set your affection on things above and not things on the earth. That's exactly what Lazarus was doing. He said, I should not be here. I should not be on earth. I was dead. And they buried me and I was in the grave for four days. And this Jesus my Savior, this Jesus the resurrection and the life, this Jesus, the one that brought a new dawn into my life, he raised me from the dead. And now he's in town. I must be with him. And because of that, he had this affection for the Lord and in each mind what the people were plotting what they were thinking they were going to do unto him and that's applicable to you and to me he brought us into life he brought us into the kingdom he brought us into the light and because of that we're going to stay with him 
we're going to abide with him. We're not going to allow anything to separate us and the Lord Jesus Christ. We're told in Romans chapter 14, Romans chapter 14, reading from verse 7, it says, For none of us leave it to himself, and no man dies to himself. Verse 8, it says, For whether for whether we live, we live unto the Lord. And whether we die, we die unto the Lord. Whether we live, therefore, or die, we are the Lord's. You know what Lazarus was thinking? Uh, the Jews said, they're going to kill him. The priest said, we're going to kill him. He said, it doesn't matter. I belong to the Lord. In fact, I don't belong to myself anymore. I shouldn't be here. I shouldn't be in the world anymore. But Jesus has given me life. And because Jesus has given me life, I'm going to give that life back to him. If I live, I belong to him. If those Jews kill me, they cannot claim my body. I still belong to the Lord. And the same thing the Lord is telling us, that now the Lord has saved you. Where would you have been if you were not saved? Where would you have been if if you didn't know Christ, what would you have been if the new dawn of salvation did not come unto you? But now he saved you, he forgave you, and he gave you a life that is well worth living. That's why you are saying like uh, Lazarus, I will be with the Lord. You'll be with the Lord in Jesus' name. No fear in your heart. I said no fear in your heart. Look at Luke chapter 1, Luke chapter 1 verse 74. Luke chapter 1 verse 74. That ye will grant unto us that we've been delivered out of the hands of our enemies might serve him without fear. You know, Lazarus was thinking, if this Jesus could get me out from the dead after I died four days, I hear now that those people are saying that they're going to get rid of me because they threw me. Many people are coming to believe. Even if they did that, the Lord Jesus Christ is still here. He did it once. He's going to do it again. And he's saying, if those Pharisees, if those chief priests, if they kill me, Jesus will still raise me up. It means I'm going to have a second resurrection. It means that life is going to come again. And because of that, he said, he'll deliver me from all my enemies. He'll deliver you from all your enemies. And then he says, I will serve him. I'm going to identify with Christ without fear. Then he says, in holiness and righteousness, before him, how many days? All the days of your life. Look at Luke chapter 12 verse 4. Luke chapter 12. I'm reading from verse 4. Luke chapter 12. Reading from verse 4. But I say and I say unto you my friends. Be not afraid of them that kill the body. You know Lazarus was thinking. I'm not afraid of them. They are threatening. They are plotting. They are conspiring. I'm not afraid of them. I'm not going to allow the fear of man to separate me from the Lord Jesus Christ. During this uh, coming retreat, fear will not keep you away. Yeah. Uh, you hear news of this and news of that. Any bad news you hear, that one is not for you. Yeah. If Jesus is for you, light is for you. Yeah. Strength is for you. Power is for you, and protection is for you in Jesus' name. That's why it says, be not afraid of them that kill the body, and after that, they, ha and they have no more that they can do. But I will forewarn you, whom ye shall fear, fear him, which after he has killed, the, after he has, killed has power to cast into hell. Yea, I say unto you, fear him. And not five sparrows sold for two fathings, and not one of them is forgotten before God. Do you understand that? Look at those little, little sparrows. And he says, this is the Lord Jesus Christ saying, that God remembers them. If God remembers those sparrows that Jesus did not die for, he remembers you because Jesus died for you. He says, even the very ears of your head are all numbered. Fear not, therefore, for ye are of more value than the sparrows. And then he goes on to say, Also, I say unto you, Whosoever shall confess me before men, him shall the, shall the Son of Man also confess before the angels of God. That he is doing this publicity now as to confess the Lord Jesus Christ, as we identify with the Lord Jesus Christ, as we invite other people, as we give them all the gifts that uh, as we put in your hand to give unto them, and they're expecting they are coming to that uh, retreat, something good will happen to you. 
and something good will happen to them. And the Lord Jesus Christ said, I will confess you before the angels of God in heaven because you confess me before men. But look at verse 9. But he that denies me before men, him that denies me before men shall be denied before the angels of God. He that denies me, I will not deny the Lord. We're coming back to John chapter 12. John chapter 12, and we're looking at verse 2. Now we come to Martha, and we look at the consecrated activity of Martha. In uh, John chapter 12, reading from verse 2. In verse 2 it says, There they made him a supper, and Martha served. There they made him a supper, and Martha served. You'll see, every time we come across a Martha, he was always serving, always serve, serving. He was active, positively active, practically active, active for the Lord, active to help in the ministry, active to support the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ and to provide all things necessary. Look at uh, Luke chapter 10, talking about Martha. Luke chapter 10, uh, we're reading from verse 38, it says, Now it came to pass as they went that he entered into a certain village and a certain woman named, what's the name there? Martha received him into a house. I pray that your house will receive the Lord Jesus Christ. When a church is brought to that house, you are receiving Jesus there. When a house fellowship is received there, it's going on there, you're receiving Jesus into your house. And then in verse, in verse uh, 39, and she had a sister called Mary, which also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. But Mary was combat about much serving. Mary was busy about much serving. Mary, sorry, Martha was uh, occupied with much serving. That was her life. I pray that will be your life. A life of service, a life of dedication, a life of consecration. In fact, what the Lord has said about the people that serve Him, about the people that give their time, that give their talent, that give their treasure, that give their money, that give their skill, that give everything they have, what He has said about the people that serve Him, what He said about Martha, and what He said about the rest of us serving Him in John chapter 12. John chapter 12, reading from verse 24. John chapter 12, we're reading from verse 24. Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abides alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. What the Lord is saying is that if you're always thinking about yourself, what will I get? How will people appreciate me? What's my gain? What's my profit? You'll be alone. Because you'll never see the reason to serve. But when you die to self-consciousness, when you die to self-esteem, when you die to self-proclamation, when you die to self-promotion, when you die to, you know, thinking about yourself all the time, then it says it's like the corn of wheat that falls into the ground and dies. And then it's going to bring forth much fruit. Then it says in verse 25, He that loveth his life shall lose it. That means the one that is pumping himself, and the one that is saying I can't go out there's danger there, there's problem there and then it's too hot or it's too cold or whatever, he says the one that loves his life is going to lose that life but he that hated his life, that he that says I don't care whatever danger whatever difficulty, whatever persecution and whatever may happen outside there I'm going to serve the Lord the Lord will preserve that life he that hateth his life in this world shall keep it unto life eternal. Look at verse 26. If a man sub me, who is that? I said if a man sub me, who is going to serve the Lord? You'll serve the Lord. If a man sub me, let him follow me. And where I am, there shall also my servant be. If any man sub me, him will my father 
honor. The Father will honor you in Jesus' name. We'll come back to John chapter 12 and we're reading from verse 3. John chapter 12 and we're reading from verse 3. It says, Then took a Mary a pouch of ointment of a spikenard very costly and anointed the feet of Jesus. Look up here. There are people that, yes, they give to the Lord, but not something very costly. Not something costly. Not something very costly. Not something precious. Not something very precious. Not something you know, that they cannot deal with that. But they give the extra. I don't need that. I can give that to the Lord. I don't need that. I can give that to you. That's why people are arguing about tithes and offering. Should we pay tithes? Should we not pay tithes? Or should we just give you know, the little change that remains unto the Lord? But look at Mary. He said, I'm not calculating tithes. I wouldn't add. I would even add offering upon thy tithe and give everything to the Lord. And she brought this that she know somebody calculated later and said we could have sold this for 300 pence. 300 pence, you understand? The laborers at that time were receiving a penny a day. And then if you remove all their Sabbaths, about 52 out of the year, and their public holidays, you remove all that, all that remains will be about 300 days. And if you pay one penny a day, one penny a day, it's like the wages of a whole year. And he was going to spend that for the Lord just at that time in a single moment. That's what the Lord is saying. When there's a need in the kingdom of God, the salary of a whole year, the income of a whole year, that we're able to give it to the Lord. That's what he's talking about. And he says he brought that uh, ointment of uh, one year's uh, salary at that time for the common people. He brought that unto the Lord. And as he brought that to the Lord, he anointed the Lord until even somebody was complaining. But let's look at uh, this uh, woman first and see what she offered unto the Lord. We're looking at Second Samuel chapter 24. Second Samuel chapter 24. And I'm reading from verse 24. In Second Samuel chapter 24, verse 24, and the king said unto her own name, but I will surely buy it of thee at a price. I will pay the price. You make a vow, pay your vow. You make a commitment, pay for that commitment. And then there's something to do for the Lord. It's at a price. It is costly. It's going to demand your time. It's going to demand your money. It's going to demand everything you've got. And David said, I will surely buy it of thee at a price. Look at this. Neither will I offer bond offering unto the Lord my God of that which does cost me nothing something cheap i cannot offer that to the lord something that has no cause i will not offer that to the lord even though this is costly i'm going to give it unto the lord and i pray that your life the most precious thing you'll give to the lord the most appreciated thing you'll give unto the Lord in Jesus' name. We we'll see the example of David there, and he's following after the example of uh, Mary followed after that same example. Look at Genesis chapter 22. Genesis chapter 22. I'm reading here from verse 1. If you're thinking about Abraham, what do you think is the most precious thing to Abraham on earth at the time when Isaac was born? Isaac was the most precious, more precious than the servants, more precious than the cattle, more precious than anything that he possessed. And look at what God said in Genesis chapter 22 verse 1. And it came to pass after these things that God determined, tested Abraham and said unto him, Abraham, and he said, Behold, here I am. And he said, Take now thy son, thine second son. What does it say? Then only son. Look at this old man, Abraham. And uh, all the promises God made unto Abraham, they'll be fulfilled through Isaac. It was the beloved son. The only son. The only son. And it says, take that son uh, whom thou lovest. Not something you hate. You know, there are some people, when you, are, when you cannot use uh, some things anymore, you give it out. And they say, that person is a giver. Well, it's a giver. But you see, the things that are precious to you, and the things you still need, the money you need, the talent you need, 
the power you need, the strength you need, the ability you need. It is that thing that is precious to you, that you need, that you are to give. And it says, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I will tell thee of. And Abraham delayed to go. What did he do? How often do you respond so quickly to the commandment of the Lord? When he says, give me your heart, how, often, how do you respond to that? And how quickly do you respond to that? Give me the money and let it go for the service of the Lord. How quickly do you respond to that? You wanted to buy land, you wanted to build house and all that. And God is saying, now the kingdom of God is more precious. And ask this need and give that. And the Lord is testing you because whatever you give is going to multiply a hundredfold at thousandfold and get back to you in Jesus name and that, that's what we find Abraham arose up early in the morning and saddled his ass and he took two of his uh, young men uh, with him and I seek his son and he cleaved the wood uh, of the burnt offering and rose up and went unto the place of the which the Lord had told him look at verse 16 in verse 16 uh, and said by myself have I sworn says the Lord for because thou hast done this sin and hast not withheld thy son thine only son the Lord still has said I appreciate what you have done because this is not just an ordinary son this is not one out of many this is the precious son and thine only son because you have not withheld him from me that in blessing I will bless thee the Lord will bless you and you multiply, I will multiply thy seed as the stars of the heaven and as the sand which is upon the seashore, and thy seed shall possess the gate of the end of their of his enemies. And then it goes on to say, and in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. Look at the reason because somebody shout because because thou hast obeyed my voice. You'll obey the voice of the Lord. We're coming to Second Chronic, Second Corinthians. In Second Corinthians chapter five, we're reading from verse fourteen. Second Corinthians chapter five, we're reading from verse fourteen. It's telling us the sacrifice we need to make today, the costly anointing we need to give today to our Savior, to our Lord, and the costly gift we need to give today to our Lord, just like Mary did. It's telling us in Second Corinthians chapter chapter 5 and verse 14 in verse 14 it says for the love of Christ constraineth us because we does judge that if one died for all they were all dead and that he died for all that they which live should not live henceforth unto themselves that they which live because we live now by the grace of God by the sacrifice of Christ, by the shedding of the blood of our Savior. And it says, that's the indication to us. We live by His grace, we live by His power, we live by His strength, we live by His spirit. We should not live unto ourselves anymore, but live unto Him that died for them, that died for us, and rose again. That's why you're doing like they did in Second Corinthians chapter 8. Second Corinthians chapter 8. Reading from verse 3. And it says, For to their power I bear record, yea, beyond their power they were willing uh, of themselves. You see, that's how we give. That's how we give. It's coming from your heart. You're giving your time. And all this period of the retreat, you're blocking the time out. You're saying, uh, it's not for visitation. It's not for festivities. It's not for going back to the village. It's not for this or that. It is to appear before the presence of the Lord. And you're willing. It's coming from your heart. And our leaders, our coordinators, our pastors, our pastors, they're not seen all the time beating the drum and all the time striking and saying, you must be there if you are not there this will happen if you are not we don't need any threat it should come from the willingness of our heart and thank God you are going to be there and it says for to their power I bear record ye beyond their power they were willing of themselves 
praying us with much entreaty. They were even pleading, please, let me give. And you know, the leader is saying, we know you don't have much. We know that this is the only thing you have. And we know that, you know, you are a single mother. And we know that you are this or you are that. And we know you need the money. So, no, please, don't deny me of my blessing. I must give. You will give in Jesus' name. Praying us with much entreaty that we should receive the gift and take upon us the fellowship of the ministering to the saints. Look at verse 5. And this they did, and this they did, not as we hoped. They went beyond our hope, but first gave their own selves to the Lord. They gave their own selves to the Lord. Somebody there, you'll give your totality to the Lord. What is the person there? Totality. Totality. You're not, uh, you know, a kind of taking anything away. It will happen in Jesus' name. And all of heaven will be poured upon your life. Will be poured upon your family. It says this they did, not as we hoped, but first give their own selves to the Lord and unto us by the will of God. That's how they did it then. That's how Mary did it. That's how Master did it. That's how Lazarus did it. That's how we're going to do it in Jesus' name. We we'll come to point number two now. The avarice and the atrocities of secretive Judas. The avarice and the atrocities of uh, secretive Judas. We're coming to John chapter 12 and I'm coming to verse 4. John chapter 12, reading from verse 4. It says, Then said one of his disciples, what's his name? Are you afraid to pronounce that? I said, what's his name? Judas is carried out, Simon's son, which shall betray him. I pray this will not happen to you. You will not betray the Lord. You will not deny the Lord. And you will not uh, send the Lord uh, back to crucifixion again in Jesus' name. He says, uh, he says this is what, what Judas said. Why was not this on my soul for 300 pence and giving to the poor? Why didn't they sell this? Why are they putting everything on Jesus? And then they, that's what the people of the world are saying. They have the spirit of Jesus is carried. They say a bright woman like this and a charming woman like this to go to Christ and then to believe in Christ and then to give his life, give her life to Christ. Why does she go and serve, you know, the world so that, you know, they need such a talent to the world. They need such a clever person in the world. Why is he putting all his life and everything is God in the church? for Christ. That's what they're saying. That's what the man here was saying. He said this is said, look at verse 6, not that he cared for the poor. He was a secretive man. He had a secret agenda. I pray you'll not have any secret agenda. But because he was what was he? But because he was telling me out aloud can you imagine somebody following Jesus who was a thief? Can you imagine somebody that had all the messages of Christ and was a thief? Can you imagine somebody that saw that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and he was still was a thief? Can you imagine see Jesus walking on the water and still being a thief? Can you imagine somebody in the boat and was with all the other people and Jesus came in? The moment he came in and said, Peace be still, everything came to a calm and everything, all the actions of Christ, all the the messages of Christ, all the miracles of Christ, everything Christ did never convert, did not convert him fully and did not convert him permanently and it says he was still a thief and he had the bag he had the bag and bear what was put therein I pray that you will not be like Judas Iscariot. How can you say, how can a person be like that? Look at why he was like that. In 1 Timothy chapter 6, reading from verse 9. 1 Timothy chapter 6, I'm reading from verse 9. It says, uh, and they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and not for laws, which draw men in destruction and perdition. You see, when Jesus Christ called uh, um, Judas Iscariot, he was at that time born again. But eventually, his mind went off to looking for money. Looking for, what will I get out of this? What will I gain out of this? And because of that, he backslid. And money became the problem. I pray money will not become your problem. Look at verse 10. For the love of money is the root of all evil. The love of money will take the love of Jesus away from your heart. The love of money 
will take the desire for heaven away from your heart. The love of money will make you to change all your consecration, all your vows. I said I will do this for the Lord. I said I will do this for the Lord. And then business is coming and the contacts are coming. All that love of money will change everything. But I pray that your life will not go down the drain like the life of Judas Iscariot in Jesus' name. It says for the love of money is the root of all evil which while some coveted after, that's what happened to him, some coveted after, they have erred from the faith. They were in the faith before, but they erred from the faith. Judas is cannot called by Christ. He erred from the faith because of that love of money and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. And uh, well, how is it that people can be hearing all that Jesus was preaching and yet there was no change? And yet, there's no permanent change in their lives. Ezekiel chapter 33, verse 31. Ezekiel chapter 33, verse 31. Open your Bible, this Bible study. Ezekiel 33, 31. And they come unto thee as the people cometh. And they sit before thee as my people. And they hear thy words, but they will not do them. Judas Iscariot had all those messages. Judas Iscariot had all the mysteries of the kingdom that Jesus revealed, but will not do them. Why? For with their mouths they show much love. Why don't you give money to the beggars? With their mouth they show much love. Why don't you sell this and then help the, help the poor people? With their mouth they show much love, but their heart goes after their covetousness. The, the covetousness in their heart and the ulterior motive they have was always the sin that ruled them. Always the sin that uh, influenced their action and their thoughts. And even when they are not consecrating their lives and other people are consecrating their lives, they will be opposing, criticizing the people that are giving everything they have got to the Lord. But thank God, Mary did not listen to Judas Iscariot. You will not listen to Judas Iscariot. Now, when somebody is a thief like that, and yet you come into church, somebody is a thief like that, and yet listening to the Lord Jesus Christ, what can you say about him? Look at Mark chapter 7. Mark chapter 7, verse 22. In Mark chapter 7, verse 22, it says, thefts, that's stealing, thieves, Thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within and defile the man. Judas eventually became defiled by that stealing. Anyone that is stealing, holding the bag and stealing, that person will be defiled. How about getting to the kingdom of God? First Corinthians chapter 6 Verse 10. First Corinthians chapter 6, we're reading from verse 10. It says, No thieves. You see, the beginning of that verse is talking about people like Judas Iscariot. They have the bag, they hold the bag, and because of it, they're stealing, they're stealing. And thieves, no covetous, no drunkards, no revilers, no extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. They will not inherit the kingdom of God. What a pity for Judas Iscariot that he saw everything that Jesus did, and even at the miracle food that Jesus multiplied and there was in the boat and the miracle came he experienced that but at last he perished and he went to the other side you will not be found on that other side uh, look at what happens to the thieves look at what happens to them in Zechariah chapter 5 Zechariah chapter 5 and I'm reading from verse 4 Zechariah chapter 5 and we're reading from verse Four. It tells us in verse 4, and uh, I will bring it forth. Let, let's go back to let's go back to verse 3. It says, Then says on, then said he unto me. Are you there? Yes. If you are there, tell me what he said unto me. Yes. Thank God you are there. I said, Thank God you are there. Yes. This is the curse that goeth forth over the face of the whole earth. For everyone that stealeth shall be cut off, as on this side, according to it, and everyone that sweareth shall be cut off, as on, the, on that side, according to it. And I will bring it forth, says the Lord, 
and you shall enter into the house of the curse will enter into the house of the team. Damnation, condemnation, hellfire will enter into the house of the thief and into the house of him that's where it was laid by my name and it shall remain in the midst of his house and shall consume it with the timber thereof and the stones thereof to be free from that we have to be real children of God and we need to be converted and we need to be saved and we need to keep that salvation what happened to Judas Iscariot? Let's see what happened. First Timothy chapter 5. This is what happened to him. First Timothy chapter 5. I read from verse 12. First Timothy chapter 5 verse 12. Having damnation because they have cast off their first faith. Having damnation because they have cast off their first faith. The love of money made them to err from the faith. Go away from the faith. Look at verse 15. For some are already turned aside after Satan. After Judas has got cast off his first faith and his first commitment and his first consecration and his first love for the Lord, then Satan had a way in his life and Satan entered in and then Satan made him to do what he did. I pray the Lord will preserve you from Satan, protect you from Satan. And that satanic temptation to steal will not remain in your heart in Jesus' name. Luke chapter 22, Luke chapter 22, verse 3. Luke chapter 22, we're looking at verse 3. Then entered Satan into Judas, so named Iscariot. Then Satan entered. He wasn't there before when he first gave his life to the Lord. And this uh, spirit of stealing, covetousness, avarice, greed was not there before. But when he turned away from the Lord and he turned after Satan, then Satan saw that he had a tool that he could use and this man could betray the Lord Jesus Christ. And it says Satan entered into Judas Iscariot. And all the warnings that Jesus gave, uh, said this man could not listen anymore. His mind could not grasp all the warnings Jesus gave. Matthew chapter 26. I'm reading from verse 14. Matthew chapter 26. And we're reading from verse 14. It says in verse 14, Then one of the twelve called Judas Iscariot went unto the chief priest and said unto them, Tell me, what will you give me? Let's strike a deal. Let's do business. Let's sell Jesus. I can sell him to your hand. I know him. I know the way he sings. I know the way he talks. I know where he goes. I know what. Any, if you want to catch him, depend on me. I can betray him to you. But you must give me something. Satan had entered into him. I pray Satan will not enter into you. He says, what will you give me? And I will deliver him unto you. And they covenanted with him for 30 pieces of silver. From that time, he sought opportunity to betray him. He sought opportunity to betray him. The Lord Jesus warned him, but because of money, you will not hear the warning anymore. The Lord Jesus Christ did not just leave him like that. He warned him. He said that this is going to be serious. Look at verse 23. And he answered and said, He that deepeth his sand with me in the dish, the same shall betray me. The Son of Man goeth as it is written of him. But woe unto that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. Listen to this. It had been good for that man if he had not been born. What's the meaning of that? If he had not been born, he will not know heaven, he will not know hell. If he had not been born, he will not exist. And he will not go to heaven, he will not go to hell. He will just, nobody will know anything about him because he wasn't born. But now, he is born into the world. He is seen Jesus Christ. He is followed after Jesus Christ. And eventually betrays Jesus Christ. He will go to hell. And that will be a terrible thing. I pray it will not happen to you. Look at verse 25. Then Judas, think about this. Judas, 
Think about it. That as Jesus was talking and said everything he said, then Judas, which betrayed him, answered and said, Master, is it I? Look at me. Do you think I can do that? Are you, am I the person you are talking about? And he said unto him, that was said, Judas, you are going to do this. And it would have been better for you if you had not been born. If you do this for 30 pieces of silver, you spend eternity forever and forever in hell. But he fell. I will not fall. You will not fall. I said you will not fall. He lost all his privileges and all his opportunities. All the privileges of the kingdom the Lord is giving you, you will not lose in Jesus' name. Acts of the Apostles chapter 1. Acts of the Apostles chapter 1. I'm reading from verse 25. Verse 25 that he may take part of this ministry and apostleship, that is, they are going to choose another person to replace him. They will not choose another person to replace you. Your place in the kingdom, nobody will take from you. Your opportunities in the kingdom, nobody will take away from you. And Satan will not take from you in Jesus' name. But in the case of Judas Iscariot, that he may take part of this ministry and apostleship from which Judas by Judas by transgression fell that he might go to his own place. What's that place? Hellfire. You will not be there. We're coming to John chapter 12. John chapter 12, point number 3 now. The acknowledgement and affirmation of some Jews. Some Jews actually believed when they saw all that Jesus Christ had done. When they saw Lazarus who was having affection for the Lord Jesus Christ. Love for the Lord Jesus Christ. And was not afraid of what those cheap priests were planning and plotting and conspiring. It tells us in chapter 12, John chapter 12. Reading from verse 10, from verse 9. Much people of the Jews therefore knew that he was there. And they came not for Jesus' sake only, but that they might see Lazarus also, whom he had raised from the dead. You know, when your life has totally turned around and changed, and people are hearing, and they say, we're coming to the church, not just, yes, we love the church because of what is happening, but we want to see brother so-and-so, want to see sister so-and-so, and you become a point of attraction, attracting them to the Lord Jesus Christ because of the glory of God upon your life and the beauty of God upon your life. And they say, because of what had happened to Lazarus, I'm going to believe in Christ. Because of what has happened to to you. They're going to believe in Christ and they're going to believe they stay with Christ in Jesus' name. Look at verse 11. Because by the reason of him, by the reason of Lazarus, many of the Jews went away and tell me and they did what? They believed on him. Let me show you something here. It said they wanted to see Lazarus and they came and they saw and believed. You see, that's how it happens. Before you believe, you see something. Before you believe, you hear something. Before you believe, you remember something. You remember this man was dead for four days. He was in the grave. And the power of Christ brought him out of the grave. And when you remember that, you say, there's no other thing. I must believe. And they knew that it was Jesus. And because they knew it was Jesus that did that, they believed. Let me, number one, they saw and they believed. They saw and they believed. We're looking at John chapter 11 verse 45. John chapter 11 verse 45. Many therefore of the Jews which came to Mary and had seen, they saw it and had seen the things which Jesus did believed on him believed on it because they saw when well, as you have seen blind eyes open as you have seen the lame rising up and walking as you have seen the power of the lord jesus and the name of jesus you see and you believe some people told them you know others they said we heard him and we believe you see you believe you hear you believe we're looking at john chapter 4 john chapter 4 
I'm reading from verse 39. John chapter 4 verse 39. Many of the Samaritans of that city believed on him. For the saying of the woman who testified, he told me all that ever I did. Look at verse 42. And they said unto the woman, now we believe. Somebody there say, now I believe. They said, now we believe, not because of thy sin, for we have heard him ourselves. We have heard him ourselves. They heard, they believed, and we know that this is indeed the Christ, the Savior of the world. But other people, it's not just what they see now, but what they remember. We remember and we believe. All the word of God we're hearing, all the miracles we're seeing, it should lead us to believe on the Lord more and more. I see and because of what I see, I believe. I hear because of what I've heard, I believe. And I remember and because of what I remember, I believe. Look at John chapter 2, verse 22. John chapter 2. Verse 22, it says, When therefore he was risen from the dead, his disciples remembered, that's the word, his disciples remembered that he had said this unto them, and they believed the scriptures and the word which Jesus had said. I remember, I believe. All this word of God that you are hearing, when you come to a crossroad, when you come to a place of difficulty, when you come to a challenging event, into your life. You remember that word and that word makes you to believe. Number one, they saw, they believed. Number two, they heard, they believed. Number three, they remembered, they believed. Number four, they knew and they believed. They knew and they believed because you now know. Look at this Lazarus. They knew Lazarus. That's a man that was dead. And now he's alive. And he knew that. And because of what he knew about what Christ has done for Lazarus, they believe. You must consider what you see so you can believe. You must consider what you hear so you can believe. You must consider what you remember so you can believe. And what you know of the word of God now so you can believe. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 3. I'm reading from verse 9. Acts, chapter 3. We're reading from verse 9. And all the people saw him walking and praising God. And they knew that it was he that sat for arms at the beautiful gate of the temple. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at that which had happened unto him. There's a man that was at the beautiful gate. And, and uh, uh, Peter says, Save and gold have I none, but what I have I give unto you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, what did he say? Rise up and walk. And he rose up and started walking, leaping and praising God. And they knew that. Look at the result in chapter 4, verse 4. Chapter 4, verse 4. How be it many of them which had the word believed, and the number of the men was about 5,000 souls. These people, they knew that this man was at the beautiful gate, and the power of God came on him, and they believed. Uh, well, we know something about them. Uh, they did not see what they saw in vain as a consequence. They did not hear what they heard in vain. There was something that came after that. They did not remember just in vain. Uh, and there was something that happened after that. They didn't just know that in vain. Uh, all that led them to believe in. And they didn't believe in vain. There are some people, it appears they believe in vain because you cannot see the evidence of that believing uh, in their lives. But but these people believed, and we can see the evidence of that believing in their lives. First Corinthians chapter 15, I'm reading from verse 2. First Corinthians chapter 15, reading from verse 2. By which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preach unto you, unless, unless ye have believed in vain. It is possible to believe in vain. When we do not see the result of that believing, it is possible to believe in vain when we cannot see the consequence of that believing. But now we're coming back to John chapter 12. John chapter 12 and here we're reading from verse 11. John chapter 12 verse 11. But because by the reason of him many of the Jews went away and what did they do? 
they believed on Jesus. In the New Testament, when people believed in Jesus and they were not believing in vain, what happened to them? Number one, they believed and they received the word. They said, this is the Christ. This is the Savior. This is the one to come. And because of that, they believed and they received the word. If you truly believe, the evidence in your life is that you receive the totality of the word of God. You say, yes, I believe him. I believe him. And the consequence of that is, I receive his word. John chapter 17, we're reading from verse 8. John chapter 17, we're reading from verse says, for I have given unto them the words which thou gavest me, and they have received them, and they have known, and surely that I came out from thee, and they have believed that thou did send me. You see the connection there? They believe that you sent me. And the word I gave them, they received the word. You will not reject the word of God if you say you believe. If you truly believe, number one, you will receive the word. Number two, you will confess. What do you confess? How do you confess? Acts of the Apostles, chapter 19, verse 18. The evidence of believing. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 19, and we're reading from verse 18. And many that believed came and confessed. You see, they believed. And because they believed, look at what they did, look at the action that followed. Many that believed came and confessed and showed their deeds. Many of them also, which use curious as, brought their books together and bunch them before all men. All magical books, all occultic books, all uh, idol worshipping books, they bunch everything. All the talisman, they bunch everything. All the waistband, they bunch everything. All the juju rings, they bunch everything. Everything regarding that associated them with the devil, they burnt everything. And it says, and they counted the price of them and found it 50 pieces of silver. You see, that's the evidence that they didn't believe in vain because you can see the result of the believing. They believed and they received the word of God. They believed and they confessed and they burnt all those things. Number three, they believed and they turned. They believed and they turned. Acts of the Apostles chapter 11. Today, if any Everybody says, I believe, I believe. It's not just an empty believing. We're going to see the evidence in your life. You believe and you turn. You believe and you turn. You turn to the Lord and you turn from anything that is not of God. Acts chapter 11, we're reading from verse 21. It says, and the hand of the Lord was with them. And a great number, what did they do? Believed. What follows that? And turned unto the Lord. They believed and they turned unto the Lord. You see, if that believing is standing as isolation, hanging in the air, there's nothing connected with it, that's in vain. That's in vain. But they believed and they received the word of God. They believed they accepted the word of God. They believed and they embraced the word of God. They believed and they confessed and they burnt all the magical things. And the things that were not of God, they burnt everything off. They believed and they turned completely whole heartedly unto the Lord. They believed and they became followers of the Lord. They believed they became followers of the Lord. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, reading from verse 6. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, reading from verse 6, and ye became and ye became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Ghost, so that ye were examples to all that believe in Macedonia and Achaia. They became a real example of true believers. And what did they do? Look at verse 9. For they themselves show of us what manner of entering in we urge unto you, how ye turned to God from idols to serve the true and living God, to serve the living and true God. They became followers, followers of the Lord and followers of the people of God because they truly believed. Number one, they believed and received. 
the word. Number two, they believed and confessed and burnt all the magical books. Number three, they believed and they turned unto the Lord. Number four, they believed and they became followers of the Lord. And then number five now, they believed to cleave unto the Lord. They believed to cleave unto the Lord. We're looking at uh, Acts of the Apostles, Acts of the Apostles, chapter 17, Acts of the Apostles, chapter 17, verse 34. How be it certain men clave unto him and believed. Cleaving to the Lord and cleaving to the people of God is like husband and wife cleaving together, never to be separated again. He has shown us the truth, he has shown us the light. We believe and we cleave unto him. Among the which was Dionysius the Areopagite, and a woman named Damaris, and others with them. In fact, it says, look at verse 11 of that same chapter 17. These were more noble than those in Thessalonica, in that they received the word with all readiness of mind, and searched the scriptures daily, whether those things were so. Therefore, many of them believed. They kept on searching the scriptures. You know, those who did not have Bibles before, they didn't have scriptures before, they got the scriptures because they now believe their heart was saturated with the word of God. Therefore, many of them believed also of the honorable women, which were Greeks and of men, not a few. Look at chapter 11, verse 23. You believe, there's going to be a consequence of that believing. There's going to be an evidence of that believing. There's going to be a practical demonstration of that believing. It tells us in Acts chapter 11 verse 23, who, when he came and had seen the grace of God, he was glad and exhorted them all that with purpose of heart they would cleave unto the Lord. With purpose of heart, they will cleave unto the Lord. That's evidence we're born again. That's evidence that we really believe and truly believe in the Lord. Now they believed and they continued for the Lord. If you really believe, you'll continue. You know, there are some people, they say, well, believe the Lord, and then you go to follow up on them, and when you get to them, they say, no, uh, I have uh, another religion. I have this one. I have that one. I, I, just, uh, I just believe. No, if you truly believe, here is the evidence, you will continue. And thank God I see people who continue there. I said, I see people who continue there. And the grace to keep on abiding till you get to the kingdom of God in heaven, that grace abundantly, the Lord will grant unto you in Jesus' name. In John chapter 8, John chapter 8, verse 30. John chapter 8, verse 30. And as he speak these words, many believed on him. Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, if ye, tell me, tell me out aloud, if ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. If ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. Continue. That's the evidence that you truly believe. If you say you believe but you are not continuing, there's no evidence that you believe. You say you believe but you are not receiving the word of God, there's no evidence that you believe. You say you believe and you are not confessing, you are not burning all the, all the evil things that you have in your possession. There's no evidence that you believe. You say you believe, you have not turned totally, wholeheartedly unto the Lord. No evidence that you believe. And you have not become a follower of Christ and implicit obedience rendered unto the Lord. There's no evidence. You're not cleaving to the Lord, staying with the Lord, abiding in the Lord. There's no evidence. But thank God there will be evidence in your life. Acts of the Apostles, Acts of the Apostles, chapter 2, verse 41, verse 42. Acts chapter 2, verse 41. Then they that gladly received this word were baptized and uh, uh, the same day there were added unto them about how many people? 3,000 souls and they continued steadfastly in the apostles doctrine and fellowship. They continued steadfastly. That's the evidence that we really believe on the Lord. I will continue. I said I will continue. 
you will continue to the end in Jesus' name. First Timothy chapter 4, I'm reading from verse 15. First Timothy chapter 4, verse 15. Meditate upon this thing. Give thyself wholly to them, that thy profiting may appear to all. Take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine. Continue in them. Continue in them. Continue in them. For in doing this, thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. I will continue. Look at Second Timothy, Second Timothy chapter three, verse twelve. Second Timothy chapter three. I'm reading from verse twelve. It says in verse twelve, ye and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Whatever comes, you will endure. And you will endure to the end in Jesus' name. But evil men, evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. But verse fourteen. But say it aloud confidently as if you are made up for a man, you are going to continue. But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast, uh, and hast been assured of knowing uh, of whom uh, thou hast learned them. You see what we have learned today about Jesus Christ that brought the new dawn for the people of Israel. And now he came to Bethany and they were going to remember the time of the Passover. And Mary was there, Martha was there, and Lazarus was there. And the three of them they showed affection. The three of them they were willing to commit their lives to the Lord afresh, totally, completely, even to offer costly anointing unto the Lord. Why are we ready about them? Why have we studied about them that we too will be doers of the world? We too will be obedient to the world all the days of our lives in Jesus' name. That's why it says in James chapter 1, James chapter 1, I'm reading from verse 22. It says, But be ye doers of the world. Be ye doers of the world. All that we are learning at the Bible study, the affection we see of, a, of a, this a Lazarus, the activity we see of Martha, and the, and the anointing we see of Mary, and the costly thing they rendered unto the Lord. All these are written, for example, upon whom the ends of the world are come, so that we ourselves will be like them. But be ye doers of the world, not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if any man be a hearer of the word, and not a doer, he is like unto a man, beholding his natural face in a glass, for he beholdeth himself, and goeth his way, and straightway he forgetteth what manner of man he was. Everything we have learned about Mary, about Martha, about Lazarus, and about their faith in the Lord, and about not believing in vain, about believing and showing the evidence were true believers, it will not go in vain. I said it will not go in vain. And because it says, For he beholdeth himself, and goeth his way, and straightway he forgetteth what manner of man he was. But whosoever, whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty, and uh, say it aloud, and continueth therein. Everything we have learned today, we are going to continue. There is a gathering that is coming. I'm going to be there. And I'm going to bring other people there. Ah, I can't hear my people. And all those things that are given also to give them uh, that came from the bank of heaven and they're going to catch it um, uh, during the retreat. You're going to bring all of them in Jesus' name. A new dawn. I said a new dawn. I'm waiting for my people there. A new dawn. It will happen in Jesus' name. Whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth daring. He be not a forgetful hearer. You are not a forgetful hearer. But a doer of the word. This man shall be blessed in his deed. I'm looking at the man there. I'm looking at the woman there. What are you? You are going to be blessed in Jesus' name. Your cup will be full and overflowing. I will continue. I said I will continue. 
Why don't you rise up and tell the Lord, you'll continue the blessings of the Lord will be upon your life. A new dawn is coming upon your life. A new thing is coming upon your life. And with all that we have learned today, everything we have seen today, it will be fulfilled in your life. More joy in your life. More happiness in your life. More blessing in your life. All the things you have been praying for, everything you have been looking for, you are going to pass over from the negative to the positive in Jesus' name. Blessings, blessing, blessings upon blessing coming upon your life. Open your mouth and make a commitment to the Lord and the Lord will bless you. And the Lord will bless you. And the Lord will enrich your life. The Lord is going to bless you. He will do it. He will do it. He will do it. Open your mouth. Tell the Lord. The Lord will confirm his blessing upon your life. 